Sarah. I just wanted to quickly comment on this. I just want to quickly comment on this interface design. I mean, it's, it's gorgeous. I, I love the interactivity of it. And I, I guess what I was wondering is, as a regular participant, uh, do you have access for this? Is this just for researchers, or is this something, This is, is this a way you can scroll through data as just a regular participant? Well, that's a great question. Right now, it is not on the user-facing side, but it certainly could be. Yeah. This is really incredible and wonderful. I'd like to see how we can collaborate, use that uh, for the work we're doing in Puerto Rico. We're going to. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I, and I should also say that the, the tips, the health information and the exposure reduction information is backed by a very large spreadsheet of citations to peer-reviewed literature. And um, in some future life, we're going to build that into the researcher's side so that research, so the program, so this, this is a tool that researchers can use to say what they want to say to their participants. But we also will provide knowledge from the studies that we've already worked with. So we already have a lot, we, the greenhousing study includes phthalates. So we already have a lot of knowledge about phthalates uh, that, that's built in. Uh, and if researchers want to know how, whether they believe us, they can then look and see what the citations are for the information. Okay, can I? Uh, sorry. Yeah. I, I made a comment and forgot to ask the question. <laughs> okay, one of the, the challenges uh, when you have uh, a testing is uh, whether the laboratory uh, has a method that actually is comparable, say, with the reference of CDC. We do not have that problem with, say, in Puerto Rico because we're using CDC, but uh, for other, uh, how do you figure out whether the results you're getting uh, from the laboratory are uh, reliable? Uh, we had that issue with uh, other things we've been working on, like autism, and, and sometimes the measure, the laboratory is really not certified. So how do you deal with just sort of the accuracy yeah. of, of reliability of the lab? Hand the mic to the woman in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that is uh, that is not a, a problem. I'm Ruth Anderdell at Sound Spring. Uh, that is not a problem that any computer program can fix. <laughs> you uh, really need uh, to have a chemist who is uh, designing the study and designing in a lot of QAQC and benchmarking and splitting samples and doing duplicates. And we take a lot of time with data uh, before we report it back, but. Um, it's a you know it's a big project to do that. There a question over here. Thanks. I have a question. Um, I'm an environmental sociologist. I teach up at a um, four-year liberal arts college up in Buffalo, New York. And one of my um, a lot of my questions in my research have to do with communities that are affected by um, legacy industrial contaminants and. They're always doing a health study and the community is getting the results and there are significant health issues in the communities. But I'm wondering, and I, I love this work, just giving you know the empowerment tools to communities to know what they're living with and, and how they're living with it. But I guess my question in my research and what I've seen so many times comes back to the point, we've kind of touched on it today, but when does it become, how much data do we need to make a change, right? So to take chemicals out of the market, Steingraber, Sandra Steingraber talks a lot about, you know, so much data is generated and we know that these problems exist. You know, how do we get that information? And we, in many points, already in Congress, people are already having congressional hearings. At what point does it take to make that policy change? And I know you touched on some of the challenges as some of our other speakers did with, um, you know, how does this translate to social action in terms of getting these chemicals off of the market, um, reducing harm, reducing exposure, um, instead of just having us as individuals reduce exposure on an, on an individual level. And, and it's the whole precautionary principle versus the burden of proof is back on the communities. And I guess that's, you know, part of what drives continual research in all of these areas, mine as well, but it becomes a point of um, diminishing returns at a point, you know, when communities have more and more studies but less and less impetus for action based on those studies. 
Yeah, that's a really interesting point, and and Cheryl actually alluded to that. Cheryl, you you want to comment about that? Sure. I could talk. About you know, it's, it's just really complicated because communities don't have often a lot of resources to uh, mount a campaign and there may not ever be definitive proof linking a particular chemical exposure to the health outcome of concern for that community. But you have to look at what factors are going on in that community and figure out where the most strategic action can take place that is actually doable. And, and, and working on toxic chemicals and, and, and working to find a safer alternative substance or process has a way of bringing together a community that can then develop a decision-making process to take on other issues as well and develop a kind of cohesion. Um, we all know it takes decades sometimes to get regulation through a state legislature or federal legislation and there are all kinds of obstacles uh, put in place for reasons of uh, 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 protecting businesses, uh, and some of that is good, and some of that is just plain obstacle stuff. But what sometimes works even more quickly is to do market campaigns, because what companies have in general is their brand and they want to protect it. So uh, talking to uh, local businesses and persuading them that this is the kind of product that they may want to explore what the ingredients are and try to uh, offer different products and make sure everybody understands what's going on. Sometimes these market campaigns can be a lot more uh, quickly moving and there are uh, communities and campaigns across the country that groups, community, small community groups can connect to and there's a wealth of information about ongoing campaigns that are trying to deal with this issue and keep us all connected to the advocacy community to work. So so if you want to talk a little bit later about what some of those campaigns are, I'd love to connect you with some people. And they may be useful or not, but it's a place to start for sure. Is that helpful? Okay. Charles, why don't you stay up here? Okay. Um, and we just take maybe one or two more questions. But I want to give a different answer to Sarah's earlier question. Um, the Like the tool... The researcher side tool allows the researcher to look at multiple chemicals at one time for any person in the study. But when you get your report, you can actually visually do that for your own results. Okay. And, and they're actually, we designed it specifically with all the chemicals in the class kind of together so you can make that comparison. And, and the researcher could decide uh, like when you design, or the researcher in, in, in communication with the community, these reports actually don't just get designed unilaterally, they get designed in conversation with study participants or their representatives and they get iterated. And so you can make it visually possible to do those comparisons. I just wanted to follow up on, on this because I'm so struck with the, the Commonwealth talk about the importance of the human story. And I loved your point about how can we make this more advocacy oriented. And I can see tons of ways to bring those stories, data driven stories, into, into what you're doing here. You know, for instance, with um, you know, a particular compound, you could have a flag saying alternative safer exists, or this was banned this year, or this industry is mostly responsible for putting out this chemical. You know, and I think there's, um, you know, we're working on a digital storytelling website right now in Wyoming, putting together people's citizen science stories um, with their personal history. And I think there's just so much potential for that kind of storytelling through the website that you're building, where you can think about adding units for people to narrate their story through their data um, and start building the same kind of campaign the Commonweal has done on a, on a grander scale. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, nice. we've been thinking about building some kind of interactive people can talk about this as a community yeah. platform. I just to follow up on that, that's really interesting because what my work has led that led to is I have a post to hear about it, but it's sharing stories and it's health narratives for social change instead of health studies. You know, instead of you know quantitative studies. So communities, community residents were really frustrated with the health representatives not being able to tell them 
if actually they were in danger, if their cancer was caused by XYZ exposure. So myself and a community organization that we linked up and said, well, let's empower people to tell their stories instead of just looking at you know, um, the general kind of conclusion from a Department of Health study in the neighborhood where it didn't give individual results like a database like this did, but it was like, well, here's your zip code and here's where you might be in danger. So that's been a really um, cool empowerment tool for us is to have each individual sit down with us and give their, you know, an oral history perspective of that narrative. And then those stories have gone to the governor. They've been, some of our residents have been asked to testify before Congress um, because of the, we had a big case, the Tonawanda Coke um, case in Buffalo was one of the first that, or the second, um, indictment under the Clean Air Act just let, uh, two years ago. So those stories where we were called on to say, can you give us some information in sentencing so we can let us people know what the actual health impacts are from their personal perspective. So that's it's nice to see it all coming together. That's cool. I have the mic again. Yeah. <laughs> I have a bigger picture question, but I think it's about putting um, data in people's hands and how it changes them um, and in so many ways. Yeah. You know, um, there's new devices on the market for you to measure your steps and you know keep track of your exercise and a lot of apps on your phone for other health promotion related things. So, you know, stepping back, not really a question only to you, but um, to the field of social science, how are we measuring out outcomes and impacts in communities as they get this information. And would we expect the same kinds of empowerment changes and attitude, literacy, et cetera, when we give people back information about biomonitoring or environmental chemicals? I think you, in your focus groups, you've asked people some questions like that, like, you know, what are you gonna do next? Yeah. Or, or follow up, you know, what have you done now? You have the information. But I think there's some work here in sort of comparative work across the various kinds of health promotion information that is now becoming very readily available. When you know your genes, you know your you know your your steps, you know your exercise, yeah. you know your diet. What about, how does the chemical scene fit into that? Yeah, that's that's a really cool area. Um, we have had participants in the Richmond study uh, take their results to public hearings and and testify. Um, we've and when we interviewed them after they got their results, we've had um, people say, "I I sort of didn't want to know, <laughs> but now that I know, I, how could I not do something about it?" And um, we've had people talk about that they go through a thought process of thinking like where could their personal exposures be coming from and then they start thinking about what could they do about it and yeah so we're really interested to learn what like pe we're hearing people say they're going to do something about it and we want it and we've seen people actually go to public meetings but I'm very interested to learn more about how what people actually do and how, for how long. And I just want to say that um, why firefighters? And it turns out that every small town has a firefighter and it was somebody's brother, father, sister, mother, whatever. And if you have a person in every small town across the country talking about toxic chemicals in the couches, insulation, or television sets, and other things they can do to protect themselves from other kinds of chemicals. Um, wouldn't that be interesting? So they're kind of thinking, for us, who the messenger is. It's not necessarily an advocacy group. It's not necessarily a researcher. But it's the person who you call when the cat is the hive of the tree and you can't get it down, right? The person you really trust to uh, put it out the toaster fire. And, and more serious things, but most calls are very, fairly calm. I just think what kind of messenger can really get the information out of this when we focus on firefighters, and I'm really interested to see what the outcome of that is ten, five, five years from now. Um, I don't know the answer to that question, um, <laughs> but I had another question. Um, one of the things that I really took away from today so far is this, uh, sorry, Deb, uh, uh, Thomas's talk earlier, um, and Cheryl, you really um, 
talked about this in a profound way during your talk, but that the power of individual stories and um, and that the, by monitoring really um, helps people to know know what their story is because environmental exposure is kind of invisible. And so, um, uh, Bridget, you mentioned um, and talked about something that I, uh, as a you know, toxicologist, sort of see a lot, which is that an industry <coughs> counter argument is really uh, these are below levels of health concern. You know, they're not uh, uh, they're not um, of health concern, and, and they're very low. And um, that uh, that argument is um, uh, it obscures the fact that in fact there's a lot of uncertainty about exactly what level is is safe. And there seem I think there's a way that the personal stories. Um, can be, it's, it's been difficult to get past that argument, but I think that personal stories are actually one way, um, one way that might, that has some potential for doing that. We didn't bring it up today, but TEDx had this other fantastic project called Critical Windows of Development that I think will be really interesting to tie together with this project of sort of saying what are the develop what do, what do we know about the developmental impacts of this of this chemical? Um, and so they just mapped it was five or six uh, different pesticides in three different species, including humans, um, for all of the all of what was known about critical windows. Um, and so that might be a really interesting project to think about integrating. Do we need to get on the bus? Time to get on the bus? <laughs> so I want to especially thank Charles and uh, Birgit for um, joining me in this panel. It's, it was really great to have you. Um, so just before we, we head out to the bus, for those who can, let me um, take the mic for a second and follow up on the lessons from today. I think um, community resilience, building communities, um, producing not just you know better educated individuals but effective communities. If you look at the firefighters example, that's come out of Silent Spring and Coming Clean and Commonweal and so many others, you know, including the firefighters and even furniture manufacturers around the country who have made a, a social movement out of the flame retardant tissue. And that's why you can get people who might not ordinarily be those messengers can be. And the, the impacts on public policy in California and then subsequently uh, here in Massachusetts and as well in the city of Boston uh, have been immense. And all these examples are examples of, it, it's not just shopping your way to safety, but it's sort of like building your own shopping mall that's your own community, you know, and it takes uh, the proverbial village. And I, I hope that's one of the lessons that we, we come out of here with, how to build those larger communities that transcend just our own geographies, but our whole uh, country and world as well. So thanks to the speakers for today. It's been just marvelous. I think the ideas and the interaction have been wonderful. I know I'm continually jotting down things to respond to and think of in the future. We've got a whole other day of this, you know, so um, it's wonderful. And again, we have the evaluation form where we hope you'll be very, very uh, interactive with us and give us lots of suggestions. We hope a lot of you will get on that bus with us. And just to say a few more words, I did say earlier in the beginning, uh, this is from the Environmental Justice League of Rhode Island that uh, those of us who were and used to be uh, and still are at Brown uh, worked with a lot. Liz Hoover, who's here, myself. Um, uh, Laura Senior, Brian Mayer. Uh, we worked very hard with a lot of people in that community and one of the beautiful things to see was the level of development, especially for youth organizing and that's one of the workshops that they're going to do tomorrow as well at the last session. Uh, they got this bus that was a beaten down old airport shuttle bus and turned it into a magnificent biodiesel living laboratory and uh, action center for environmental justice. So when you join us to go over to ACE's Jamming for Justice party, you're going to be sitting on a bus with an incredible rich history. Um, ACE is a, is a great friend of ours, a great friend to the city of Boston and to the, the whole country in terms of environmental justice. And so we hope as many of you as, as possible will come and support them tonight in Jamming for Justice. 
So that bus is loading now, and it is at the back entrance of Curry. And here are some maps if anybody is having to go themselves um, walking or driving or taking a cab. We'll see you tomorrow. We start at 9 in the morning, uh, so come earlier for breakfast.